Welcome to the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. I'm your host, Eric Bjornstad, your guide to the ever-changing world of fuel. If you haven't joined us before, the Fuel Pulse Show podcast is for anyone who has fuel or who has things that use fuel, and that means either at work or at home. And since uh, we all have things that use fuel, then that means that the Fuel Pulse Show podcast is for pretty much everyone. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we are going to want to talk about the start of the summer driving season. Right now, it's a rather rainy day in the month of June here in Central Florida, and the kids are out of school, and people are starting to think about what they would like to do on their summer vacations. Summer typically means more driving than during the spring and the winter time. Typically, there are uh, summer driving road trips that people elect to take. And given the fact that we are coming out of a pandemic where uh, driving habits were, shall we say, depressed, um, there's going to be, you know, if not a record number of people on the roads this year, there's going to be a significant number more than there were over the past couple of years as we continue to leave the pandemic further and further away in our rearview mirror, no pun intended. So this time of year, summer driving season, we usually talk about and we usually think about how to save money on gasoline. And to be honest, right now, how much fuel costs is a really big topic of discussion right now. Last time that we checked, the price for gasoline, national average for gasoline, was pushing right at around $5 a gallon. It's a record high across the country. If you're in California, you're looking at closer to $7 a gallon than you are 5 And people are really concerned about this. And whenever gas gets more expensive, people start to pay more attention to the answers to questions like, How do I get the most out of my gallons of gasoline? How do I maximize my fuel economy? Those kind of questions. And so that's what we want to talk about today. It's a little bit, uh, this podcast episode is slanted a little bit more towards the uh, consumer. And that's okay. Uh, So uh, uh, let's talk about gas mileage. So gas mileage, when you're talking about how to maximize it, you've got two real main factors at play here. You've got uh, the, you know, what you're driving, first of all, the cars and the trucks and the engineering and the mechanical issues centered around those. And then the second thing is driver behavior. And so we're going to talk about what's happening with the fuel efficiency of cars and trucks. And then we're going to talk about uh, ways that you as a driver can Max can can drive more efficiently so that you can get uh, the most out of your gallons of gas. So let's start with cars. Uh, the bottom line with cars and trucks are that they are more efficient, more well-designed than they ever have been in our nation's history. Um, they are better engineered. And there are these federal regulations called CAFE standards, which have really forced a dramatic change in the fuel economy across the automobile industry. So let's talk about those for a moment. CAFE is an acronym, stands for Corporate Average Fuel Economy. And those are basically the rules that the federal government has enacted to essentially force change upon the automobile industry and force them to make their cars and trucks more fuel efficient. Now, some people, when they hear, you know, government regulations forcing the industry to change, they get a little bit, uh, you know, they get their ire up about that. Um, but to be honest, some there are certain things that the private sector cannot always be relied upon to implement uh, certain kinds of changes on their own. The private sector is going to do what they think is going to make them the most money. Now, we're not judging that. We're not saying that's good or bad. That just is the way it is. And sometimes those, those in fact, we'll say many times, those uh, changes that they make on their own turn out to be really good for consumers. Um, you can think of things that have happened where 
the there have been innovations, for example, that have come out of the private sector competing against each other. And the results of those innovations have been things that have really made all of our lives better. So and make no mistake, that happens uh, you know, more often than you might think. However, on the flip side, that doesn't always happen. And those who think that the private sector always does what's best for society, what's best for the environment, do not have a realistic view of how these things work. The private sector cannot always be relied upon to implement changes that may end up costing them. The private sector actually has to have a reasonable expectation that they're going to make a profitable return upon their investment. And when we say profitable return, it's not, that doesn't necessarily mean pure dollars and cents. It could be profit in terms of some other kind of benefit, like a better, uh, I don't know, social, um, uh, social, you know, increased social capital increased public positive public perception of their company those all th those things can result in tangible value and sometimes the private sector will do things because of those considerations but not always and so when it comes to making more fuel efficient vehicles the thing is is that um, it costs money to do that and the private sector many times will not elect to do that unless they have, shall we say, a little motivation. And that is where the federal re regulations with the CAFE standards come in. So CAFE standards, those standards come from or are derived from the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. And this is a piece of legislation from Congress. And one of the things that the Energy Policy and Conversation uh, Conservation Act requires is it requires the Department of Transportation or DOT, it requires DOT to establish separate fuel economy standards for passenger cars and light trucks under uh, about 8,500 pounds. So it defines what the what what is meant by passenger car and light truck. And then the, the Energy Policy and Conservation Act requires the Department of Transportation to enforce those mileage standards. And so what the DOT does is it delegates that enforcement responsibility to the National Highway, Tra uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, I believe I got that acronym right. We call it NHTSA, N-H-T-S-A. So DOT... Uh, delegates the responsibilities for enforcing those mileage requirements to NHTSA. Now, one thing someone might say, they might say, well, can't a state, and, and this, this is especially apropos in the, shall we say, the divided times that we live in, where we have red states and blue states. And very rarely do they agree on things, and very rarely do they look at each other and say, yeah, I think you're doing the right thing. So what would happen if somebody said, uh, you know, California, they're kind of crazy. Um, let's say the state of Texas, because Texas or Oklahoma, Oklahoma is the most conservative state in the nation. So what would happen if Oklahoma said, well, we don't like these federal standards, uh, so we're just going to make our own. Um, we're going to uh, say that um, you can't have a car, you can't make us make cars that, uh, or use cars that have, uh, or that, that get fuel mileage above, I don't know, 20 miles per gallon, whatever. Well, the law supersedes that kind of, 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 of act super, supervening, uh, super in superventing, whatever it, it, the law heads that off by saying that a state or a political subdivision of a state may not adopt or enforce a law or regulation related to fuel economy standards. So what that means is that the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, those rules apply to everyone and a state or a county or a city can't just say, well, we don't we don't like Joe Biden or we don't like Donald Trump or we don't like you. So we're not we're, we're just going to have our own standards. They are prohibited by law from doing that. So this standard applies to everyone. And so out of this standard comes the corporate average fuel economy standard, the CAFE standard. 
And what the CAFE standard is, it's a standard, it's a minimum mileage standard that is applied across the entire fleet of vehicles that are made by a manufacturer in a given model year. And it actually takes the what they call the harmonic mean of that. Um, if you're really interested, you can go on Wikipedia, type in harmonic mean, you'll get this really weird looking formula. But pretty much it's the average. So it states that uh, uh, the average fuel economy for all the cars and light trucks of a certain size that are manufactured by Ford or Hyundai or uh, Tesla or whatever in a given model year have to be at least X. That's the CAFE standard. Now, what happens if a manufacturer doesn't meet this standard? Well, they can do uh, several things and none of those several things are, going, are not going to cost them money, shall we say. So if a manufacturer falls short of meeting this standard across their fleet, they either have to uh, essentially buy CAFE credits, as they call them, CAFE standard credits. They have to buy those to cover the difference, which they will typically do beforehand. Or they have to pay a penalty for every like 0.1 miles per gallon that they fall short so that they fall under the given standard. And I'm not sure what the, the, the penalty is, but let's just say that it is large enough for them not to want to do that. So these CAFE standards, okay. So they designate a minimum fuel economy and they penalize the automaker if they don't reach that standard. Now, CAFE standards themselves, they have not always been with us. They were first introduced around 1978. And when they first came out, they applied, they didn't apply to all vehicles, they applied only to passenger cars. So 1978, the first CAFE standard for passenger cars come out and it's 18 miles per gallon. Okay, 18 miles per gallon in 1978. But they were designed to gradually go up and up and up because the, the government wanted to force uh, the, the, the movement in the direction of having more fuel efficient cars and trucks. And so they gradually increased until uh, 1986, they were at 26 miles per gallon. Okay, that's great. But then what happened? Well, for the next 25 years, they essentially didn't change. They were 26, they might've gone up to 27. By the time, uh, you know, 2010 rolls around, they've gone from 26 to 27 and a half. So essentially they haven't changed. And the fact that we went two plus decades of these not changing, I think that's why it was such a shock when in 2008, uh, President Obama gets elected. And one of the first things that the Obama administration does is they say, look, CAFE standards haven't changed they need to change. They need to, you know, we need to uh, uh, help the environment by making cars and trucks more fuel efficient. And so we're going to revisit those and we're going to force some change here. And a lot of people were essentially shocked by that because again, they had gone 25 years without having to do anything. So the Obama administration almost immediately in January of 2009, because if you remember, a president's elected in 2008, and then they get inaugurated January the following year, and then they get to work. So January 2009, the Obama administration immediately looks at the regulations and raises the standards dramatically. They also split the requirements up, so they made more categories. So instead of it being just passenger cars and light trucks, they actually split them up into a bunch of different categories, some of which in the passenger car uh, category, they actually split that up into three categories related to how big the car was, not necessarily how much the car weighed, but actually how big the car was. It's uh, what they call its footprint. And so they created three categories. They created small cars, like, uh, I don't know, the Honda Fit, um, which I assume is one of those really small cars. They had medium-sized cars, which would be like the Toyota Camry, your standard family-sized sedan. And then they had large cars, like the, you know, a Mercedes. So they split them up, 
and they announced new, tougher standards that are going to be phased in over a period of time. And those standards were pretty dramatic for a change. Um, remember, 2010, they're at 27 and a half average miles per gallon across the fleet for cars. Well, by 2020, the requirements were going to be between 36 if you're a small car to 48, or excuse me, 36 for a big car to 48 miles per gallon for those small cars. Remember, we're going from 27 to 48. And then they were really going to ramp up from 20. Uh, from 2020 to 2025, they were supposed to increase up to between 45 and 61 miles per gallon. So think about it. In 2010, uh, the average uh, economy was 27 and a half. Uh, now, 15 years later, they're going to be uh, 61. They're going to be more than doubled. And naturally, that kind of shocked a lot of people. Now, me personally, I can understand why they did it, because if you remember anything from back in 2008, that was when people really started paying more attention to the environment. They really started to, to realize that if they really thought that climate change was happening, and there were more and more people who agreed that, yes, it was happening, then they were going to be more amenable to... Um, the 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 fact that we were going to have to have uh, significant and maybe even painful changes in some of the things that we do. And so the pain in this case was being passed on to the automakers. So the Obama administration issues these new rules. A lot of people complain about them, but they are what they are. Uh, then President Donald J. Trump gets elected. Uh, 2016 immediately, surprise, surprise, rolls them back. He freezes the CAFE standards at 37 miles per gallon. Um, then in 2020, President uh, Joe, Joseph R. Biden gets elected. And not surprisingly, he revisits and he essentially undoes the Trump administration's freezes. And that is where we are today. So what are the CAFE standards uh, for today? Well, uh, the CAFE standards, you know, this is the year 2022. So the standards are that next year, 2023, the average corporate fuel economy uh, standard across the different kinds of cars and light trucks is going to be between, have to be between 38 and 51 miles per gallon. And then 2024, 2025, 2026, they're going to be scaling up so that by 2026, so in yeah, four years, they are four model years, they are going to have to be between 50 and 67 miles per gallon. And it's really astonishing to think about the changes that are going to have to happen in car and truck design in order to be able to meet that standard. But that is the task that has been put forth with the automobile industry is having to meet that. So, uh, you know, 2010, 27 and a half miles per gallon, um, but 16 years later, they could be facing having to meet, uh, make cars that go 67 miles per gallon. We're looking at huge, huge differences in the fuel economies of the cars and trucks that we have now versus the ones that we had in the past. Now, when you're talking about a thing like CAFE standards, there are lots of other things you could talk about, lots of other things you could debate about, because there are still people who argue about whether they're needed or whether they are having the effect that they were purported to have. I mean, there are uh, some some people who will, some analysts, we'll call them industry analysts, who will argue that CAFE standards don't aren't actually as effective at doing what we want them to. Um, and then you've got the fact that automakers, and you know, we do have to consider this. Automakers raise the point that in order to design either a new vehicle or make this kind of significant changes to an existing model that would be needed in, in order to meet these standards, uh, in order to do any of that from a design and engineering standpoint, they are having to pour billions of dollars into redesigning these cars and trucks. And that's okay if they are confident 
that they'll be able to sell them and make that money back. And the automakers are basically saying that they don't think that they will be able to get that money back. And the reason why is because uh, cars that are really fuel efficient, they tend to be smaller and they tend to be, at least they tend to be perceived to be smaller. And that's a problem because when you're talking about consumers, if a consumer sees a smaller, more fuel efficient vehicle, they expect it to be less expensive. They don't expect to pay more for a vehicle that's smaller and looks like it's more efficient. And so the automobile makers are saying, uh, yeah, we can design them and put them out on the market, but the consumers aren't going to buy them for the prices that we will need to charge in order to make that money back. That is a problem I can't personally answer, but it is a problem that's being put out there by the automakers, and they will eventually have to figure out uh, how they're going to balance those considerations, complying with the government regulation, governmental regulations, while also maintaining profitability. So my view on all this is like with many things, they will eventually figure all of this out. So the cars and trucks themselves are more efficient than ever before. Now let's talk about gas prices. Gas prices, as you well know, this being June of 2022, are hot, the highest that they have ever been in our nation's history, pushing $5 a gallon in across the country, and depending on where you are, six, seven dollars a gallon. Now, my view on all this is that this is somewhat of a cyclical problem. Now, this doesn't help someone who's trying to fill up their car right now, but uh, I think that this is going, they're not going to stay up at that level forever. They will eventually go down, but they are what they are right now. And so if you are looking, making your summer plans, and you want to go drive, you know, across several states to visit grandma's house. Uh, like for myself, I grew up in central Maryland until I was about 12 years old. My grandma and grandpa lived in northern Indiana. So I remember many road trips from Maryland to Indiana. That's a fairly long drive, especially that part where you have to drive across the state of Ohio. You know, uh, Ohio's a, a really wide state. Um you burn a lot of gas doing that. And if your your gas is $5 a gallon or $6 a gallon, you're going to be looking at this summer road trip thinking, man, th th this, this is going to put an even bigger bite on my wallet than uh, I anticipated last year when we started thinking, wouldn't it be nice to drive three states over and see grandma? So uh, you're probably thinking, um, what can I do to lessen the pain as much as possible? The cars themselves have been optimized. There's not a whole lot you can squeeze out of there. However, there are two things that you can look at to ease this pain the most. And that is how you drive and what condition your vehicle is in. Not how is the vehicle designed, but how is it maintained and what is the condition that it's in. So let's, let's unpack those two things a little bit. First of all, driver behavior. Uh, you've heard the old adage that 85% of people think they are above average drivers. I think that that is definitely true. Everyone thinks that they are a great driver. In reality, uh, not so much, but everyone thinks that they are. So when we say how you drive is the biggest thing that's going to influence your, um, your, your gas mileage, there's a natural psychological tendency to say, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, that's for the other person. I can't really improve. So, so take this with an open mind. So driver behavior is the single biggest influencer on whether you get good gas mileage or not so good gas mileage. Now, when you're driving a car, um, when you, you know, you start from zero, the car uses the most fuel to gain speed, right? Uh, when you are accelerating and getting yourself up to speed, you're burning that gasoline, you're, you're converting the chemical energy in that gasoline into work with the engine, which is propelling your car forward and uh, maintaining a certain speed. So you use the most gas when you're going up to speed. 
in order to maintain speed, you don't, you actually don't use very much fuel at all. And that is why highway driving is uh, so much more fuel efficient than city driving is because it takes relatively little amount of gas to maintain 60 miles an hour than it does to get up to 60 miles an hour. So why do we say that? Well, we say that because in order to make the statement that how you accelerate is going to make a big difference. Do you accelerate quickly versus do you accelerate gradually? And then also when you're, you're in the flow of traffic, how do you control your speed so that you will be able to, shall we say, conserve your forward motion or your conserve your momentum as much as possible? Uh, there are ways, if you really pay attention to it, there are ways for you to minimize the amount of, uh, shall we say, wasted energy that you use. And what I mean by wasted energy, I mean, let's say, that you're, you're, you're at a stoplight in a city with a moderate amount of traffic and the light turns green and boom, you take off and you're going up from zero to 40 miles an hour, but you want to get there fast. So you're going up quick as possible. So you punch it and you're up to 40 miles an hour. And then uh, a half mile later, another red light and you have to stop. Well, you got there. However, how much more gas do you think you burned versus somebody who took off gradually because they know that there's a red light in half a mile. And so they accelerate gently and they get up to speed and then they see, oh, it's a red light. So they decelerate. They get there in about the same amount of time because remember that first person is going to get to that red light and then they're going to stop and they're going to wait. That other person is pulling up behind them and they're both at the light at the same time. The difference is that that first person, the one who wanted to gun it out of the starting block, so to speak, has burned substantially, we'll call it substantially more gas than the second person. And they both got there about the same time. Now, when we say how much, you know, when I say substantially, what exactly is substantially? What are we talking about? Well, if you look at people who uh, who study this kind of stuff, they say that there's about a 30% difference in fuel economy between somebody who's an efficient driver and a person who is an inefficient driver. 30%. Now that may not, that, that to some people that may sound just like, you know, it's just a number, 30% doesn't mean anything. How does that translate into actual tangible, shall we say money? Well, Let's say you drive 12,000 miles a year, average amount, and depending on if you drive in the city or on the highway, let's say that you average your good drive, you're an efficient driver, as they say. And so you average about 30 miles per gallon between the city and the highway. So that means you're burning about 400 gallons a year doing that. Um, if you're an inefficient driver, let's say you do everything that you're not supposed to do and you get 30% less or lower mileage than the first person. Um, you're going to be burning about 30% more gasoline, which means you're actually going to be burning, I think, about 170 gallons more per year than maybe 140, 140 to 170 gallons. And if, the, if your gas is, oh, I don't know, 475 a gallon like it is right now, then you will actually spend an extra $800 per year in fuel for being a, and shall we say, an inefficient driver versus an efficient driver. So how you drive uh, really does matter. Um, another thing that they will look at is uh, the, the um, shall we say, the engine RPMs. Now, what do we mean by this? RPMs, we're talking about how your engine revs. Now, what we mean is... Um, uh, engines, uh, and th this is especially true for larger vehicles, including big rigs. And like mo uh, most professional truck drivers already know this kind of information. They say in general, when you're looking at a vehicle engine, um, the engine will operate most efficiently when it's at high torque and low engine speed. That relates to the gear that it's in. Um, and this means that the fuel efficiency penalty for an internal combustion engine um, 
uh, is, is the smallest when the vehicle's operating in high gear. Um, why is that? Well, part of it is because there's, there's the least amount of friction. Um, so when we say fuel efficient penalty, what we mean is the fuel efficiency penalty of an engine's friction is minimized the most when it, the engine's operating in high gear. So a driver who's trying to be fuel efficient, what will they do? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to avoid um, over revving the engine. They're trying to avoid high engine speeds. And they're going to do this by moving up smoothly through the gears until they you know, increase their vehicle speed to where they want it to be. So basically, long and short of it is they are trying to shift up through the gears as smoothly and consistently as possible. That will actually make a difference in their fuel economy. Um, now, earlier we talked about, and by earlier, I mean a couple minutes ago. A couple minutes ago, we talked about the fact that if you were an inefficient driver, you, you know, it might end up costing you like 800 bucks a year more in gas for being, that's the penalty that you're going to pay, the tax that you're going to pay for being an inefficient driver. But there is not just financial cost to this, there's also environmental cost to this. So this is for those of us who uh, pay attention to our environmental impact. The more fuel that you burn to do the same amount of work, the more CO2, the more carbon you're putting into the atmosphere. So what are we talking about? What scale are we talking about here? Well, they say that every unnecessary gallon of gasoline that's burned by a car puts an extra 19 and a half pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. If it's a gallon of diesel fuel, diesel is a little bit denser. It's got more car more larger carbon molecules in it. So every extra gallon of diesel that's burned puts a little bit over 22 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere. So if you're a consumer driver, driving remember driving that 12,000 miles a year that we referenced earlier, but you're an inefficient driver, then not only are you paying an extra 800 pound, uh, excuse me, $800 inefficiency tax, so to speak, you're also putting an extra one and a half tons of carbon dioxide into the environment. Now, uh, I recognize that just saying one and a half tons, that doesn't mean anything to the typical person. So to keep it in perspective, um, one and a half tons of carbon dioxide is the amount of CO2 that would be captured in one year by 75 trees. So if you want to be an inefficient driver and you want to minimize your environmental impact, you could go uh, plant 75 trees and you, know, you could break even. Problem is we're not going to do that, but that's the environmental impact. Now, keep in mind that that figure is just for the consumer cars. What about the semi-driver? If a semi-driver is a good driver and drives 40, you know, uh, uh, the average semi could drive uh, around 45,000 miles a year. Or if it's a long haul, long distance semi-truck, you might be looking at 100,000 miles a year. And so the environmental impact because of the difference between 12,000 miles and 45,000 miles and a 100 thousand miles, uh, the environmental impact is could be proportionally greater. So instead of one and a half extra tons of CO2, it could be five and a half extra or 12 and a half extra tons of CO2 just from the driving habits uh, that, that, that you're engaging in. So that's the environmental impact. We already know the financial impact. So how do you drive to best conserve fuel? Well, we already talked about uh, trying to accelerate gradually. One thing we have not talked about, which is a big, big factor, is your speed. You know, watch if you want to, the best way to conserve fuel is to watch your speed. Now, um, for cars, the magic, the cutoff point I don't know, fulcrum, cutoff point, sweet spot, whatever you want to call it, is 50 miles an hour. Now, 
every five miles an hour that you go above 50, it, it lowers your, your gas mileage and raises, essentially creates an effective increase in the amount of, uh, you know, the, the amount that you're paying for gas because you're using more. So every f- five miles an hour above 50 miles an hour that you drive raises your effective cost for gasoline by 33 cents a gallon, which is about 7%. So it raises it by 7%. So instead of paying 475 a gallon, if you're driving 55 instead of 50 on the highway, you're not paying 475, you're paying 508. And that's only if you average 55. I remember when I would drive home from Southeast Tennessee to Maryland, uh, you know, when I was a young whippersnapper, um, I wouldn't, 50 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour on the highway? No. I'm driving 65 miles an hour? No. I'm driving 75. I'm, I drive 80 if I thought I could get away with it. Um, most of the time I did. But no, usually I'd be like 78, 79, trying to hit that uh, a cruise control so that I'm going as fast as I can with the least chance of actually getting pulled over. So if you're driving 65, which is a reasonable expectation for most people, if you're driving 65, you're actually paying $1 extra per gallon versus if you were driving 50. And that means that if you've got a typical 17 gallon uh, gas tank and you're filling it up, it's going to cost you about 80 bucks to fill it up unless you're uh, driving 65, in which case you actually end up paying effectively 97, an extra 17 cents a tank above that $80 base. So watching your speed and watching how you get to that speed, those are two really big things that you can do. Probably the most important things that you can do if you want to minimize the the gas mileage pain of this summer road trip that you're going to be taking. Now, let's talk about the condition of the vehicle. We've already said cars are engineered uh, better than they have been before. However, how you take care of the vehicle and the condition that you keep it in will have some impact. It will not have as much impact as how you drive would. But Every little bit does help. And so there are a few relatively easy things that you can do to squeeze a few more, shall we say, a few extra cents per gallon out of your gas mileage. Um, Some say that you should pay attention to the excess weight in the vehicle. Well, all of the things being equal, if you don't need it to be in your trunk, take it out because you're going to burn gas hauling that around. Now, let's keep this in perspective. How much extra gas are you going to burn? They say, again, does depend on the vehicle, but for every extra 100 pounds that you have in there, you lose about 1% fuel economy. Um, you know, 1% is 1%. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to have the most, um, most difference, if you will, by the number of people that you have in there, and you can't really change that. But like I said, if you don't need it in the vehicle, then don't haul it around, take it out so that you won't be burning that little bit extra gasoline just for the privilege of having something in, hauling something around in your trunk that you didn't need there anyway. Uh, Let's talk about tire pressure. Tire pressure is something that does affect gas mileage. Now, they say that every extra PSI, pounds per square inch, that you have in your tires affects your gas mileage by about four-tenths of a percent. So that means if you have 10 extra PSI, uh, you've inflated your tires to, um, I don't know, 45 instead of uh, 35, um, you're going to reduce your gas mileage or excuse me, you're going to improve your gas mileage by 4%. So the higher the PSI you go, the better the gas mileage you're going to get. And the reason that is, is because it relates to how much a tire is in contact with the road. If the tire is more heavily inflated 
it's if it's firmer then there's going to be less tire pressed up against the road and you're, you're going to lose less energy transmitted essentially from the car through down to the road in terms of things like friction and heat um so uh inflate and and if it's in the summer then inflating your tires more um won't affect you nearly as much. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's give that some context. Um, the more that you inflate your tires, that means less of them is going to be in con less less of it. Excuse me, it's going to be in contact with the road. Um, that affects how it drives in the rain. Now, in the summer, they don't tend to get unless you're in Florida, of course. You don't tend to get as much rain, and so it's not as much of a safety consideration because it is a safety consideration. Your tires are the only things in the car that are actually in contact with the road. So if you do overinflate your tires, you do run a risk of not being able to handle as safely in the rain as you need to. So there's a trade-off that goes there. Plus, if you inflate your tires more, you will actually make them wear out faster. So again, you as a driver have to take all of these things into consideration. You can inflate your, 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 your tires a little bit higher. You'll get a little bit better gas mileage, but the, the, the book is still, the jury's still out on whether you will actually come out ahead in the long run because uh, you may save money in gas, but you will uh, at the same time You'll put more wear on your tires, which means you will have to replace them faster, which means you may not end up saving money after all. So it's something you're going to have to consider. What we would say is always pay attention to whatever your vehicle manufacturer recommends uh, that your tire pressures be. And then it's your decision how much you want to deviate from that. Um, okay, last couple of things. Um, lubricants. Now, oil is one of those things. Uh, if you go out there and you look at, uh, let's say you go to Walmart and you look at, uh, you know, some things, additives for your oil, many times they'll talk about how they'll save you gas. They'll improve your gas mileage. Now, you always have to take those kind of claims with a huge grain of, of, of salt. Um, your, your oil does affect your gas mileage. However, we will say that just as a general rule, an oil additive probably isn't going to save you anything substantial on your gas mileage. Um, but, you know, and, and if an oil additive claims to, you know, it's going to save you 5% or 10% in your gas mileage, you can probably just walk on past that because they know that's not true. They just want you to believe that it could possibly be true and spend your money on their additive. It's very likely that somebody who's going to make that claim probably doesn't have your best interests in mind. You should probably just walk on by. Now, that being said, if you talk to major oil companies, the ones and major engine manufacturers, what they'll talk about is that your lubricant in your engine, your lube oil, there can be somewhat of a difference in the amount of friction that's inside your engine uh, when you compare using a low viscosity lubricant and versus a higher viscosity or a heavier lubricant. Now, if you don't know anything about oil, if you've seen the oils and you see those numbers like 5W30, 15W40, those are essentially viscosity numbers. Those are weights. And modern oils today, oils that are optimized for today's engines, they actually have viscosity modifiers that will change the thickness of the oil uh, from when it's cold to when it's hot um, so that they'll perform as they and provide the protection that they need to inside those engines. Um, a lighter weight oil can improve your gas mileage in the summer. So that's why many manufacturers actually had started using ever since about, for, I, really for the past 10 years almost, since about 2013, Many manufacturers actually have used as standard fill in their engines when they rolled them off the assembly line floor. They actually started putting lower viscosity oils, like a 5W30. They started putting those in their engines 
uh, versus the heavier ones like 15W40 because it helps your gas mileage. Now, how much will it help your gas mileage? Again, it's not going to save you 10%, 20%, some crazy number like that, but it can save you like 1% to 3%. And if you can get that extra 1% to 3% just from the kind of oil you use, again, you don't have to pay extra for an oil additive, but just the, kind, the weight of oil that you use, well then take the one to 3% and bank it. So the lubricant, the engine lubricant can have a small effect. Last thing is how clean is your engine? So um, in terms of the engine itself, the best thing that you can do for that engine to make sure that it runs at its most efficient and therefore gives you the most, shall we say, amount of work out of each gallon of gas, the best thing you can do is make sure that your fuel injectors are as clean as they can be. If your fuel injectors are clean, they will work optimally. They will give the optimal spray pattern, which will cause optimal combustion in the engine, which means that engine, which is designed by a whole team of really, really smart automotive engineers who know what they're doing, that engine will give you the best performance possible and the most efficiency possible. So the best thing that you can do is make sure that your engine's clean. Now, let's talk about, well, and the way that you clean your engine is you have a detergent in the gasoline, an injector detergent. Now, um, before the 1990s, gasolines were not required to have detergency. Now you could buy aftermarket like injector cleaners or aftermarket uh, you know, multifunction gasoline additives that had detergent in them. And those were good things. But the, the normal gasoline that you would buy at the pump wasn't required to have gas uh, a detergent in that gasoline, but that changed in the mid '90s, specifically around 1997. That's when the rule came in place that all gasoline sold in the United States was required to have at least a minimum amount of injector detergent in it, and they called that minimum amount they called it the LAC, the lowest acceptable concentration of detergent, and the, the rationale was that having all gasoline have detergent in them would cl essentially clean engines across the country and make them more fuel efficient, make them better for the environment. And by and large, that was true. Now, the debate happens to be now, it's not, you know, the, the debate isn't, is having detergent in those engines a good thing or not? It is a good thing. The debate now is, do they have the right amount of detergent in there? Because you have, shall we say, regular gasolines that have the LAC concentration of injector detergent in there. And then you have these gasolines that are branded as top tier. And top tier gasolines actually have a higher level of detergency in there. Now, I don't say this to, to, you know, to, to make some setup to where I can say, but they're wrong. Top tier gasolines don't do anything. No, top tier gasoline's actually a really, really good idea. And if uh, and many many of the gasolines that you will come across at your stations are top tier gasolines, even if you don't know it. But if you do have a, if you do know enough to know that hey, this station over here is selling regular gasoline, uh, you know, and let's say the same price. And this gasoline uh, station across the street has top tier gasoline. I myself would go for the top tier because the top tier designation is actually meaningful. Uh, you do want a higher level of detergency in your gasoline because you want to make sure that your fuel injectors are as clean as possible. Now, if you're unsure, you can purchase an aftermarket fuel active. Now, uh, Saying that is kind of like throwing, uh, throwing a, you know, a big hunk of chum into shark-infested waters because there are thousands of people out there who are vying for your money when it comes to fuel additives, and they will make crazy claims, shall we say. 
Um, Bell Performance itself has been in the fuel additive formulations business for a long time. And we're not here to talk about whether, you know, what we make is, you know, better or worse than, uh, you know, the other stuff that you can buy. That's not really the point of what we're talking about here. Um, so I want to just stick to the, the higher level of conversation on this and just say that the best thing that you can do for your engine is uh, make sure that it has a high quality injector detergent uh, uh, in the fuel that will keep the injectors clean so that they will function uh, at their peak level of efficiency. Now, how much improve, how much fuel economy improvement can you expect to get? That depends on how dirty your injectors were to begin with. The older the engine, the more likely your injectors are to actually be dirty. If your engine is new, you know, if you just, you know, if, if, if you've got a vehicle that's rolling out the showroom floor, you probably don't need an injector detergent in there to clean the injectors. Maybe to keep them clean, that would be a good idea. But those injectors are probably fairly clean. And if you were to use an injector cleaner in there, you wouldn't necessarily notice a substantial improvement in gas mileage because that engine, because it's new, is at working as well as it's going to. But if you have an older vehicle, say you've got more than 30,000 miles, 30, 40, 50, going to 100,000 miles or more, um, it may be worth, uh, if you're unsure about the detergency that's in your gasoline, it could be worth uh, just putting in an injector cleaner or putting in a good quality multifunction additive from a reputable company that has quality injector detergent in there that will clean those injectors out. So, uh, summer driving. If you're going on a summer driving road trip, the thing that you want to do, you want to make sure that your engine's clean. You want to make sure you changed your oil naturally. You want to make sure that your tires are inflated to the proper uh, uh, you know, pressure of inflation. Uh, you want to make sure that you have only what you need in the vehicle, you know, extraneous weights out of the vehicle. You want to pay close attention to how you drive, especially when you're on the highway. Um, you know, use cruise control. Cruise control is your friend in this. So if you do all of those things, you're going to get about as good gas mileage as you can hope to get. And these days, with the price of gas being the way it is, uh, you know, that here, you know, here's, here's wishing and hoping that you have a safe driving, uh, summer driving road trip this year, and that it does not hurt your, it does not hurt your wallet uh, as much as you fear that it might. So that about wraps it up for this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. Uh, check our show notes for links and information on things that we talked about today. Those are at www.bellperformance.com. If you liked what you heard, then please subscribe to this podcast. Tell your friends. Tell them to subscribe to it. Give us a, a rating on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. And again, tell your friends about the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. So till next time, thank you very much for joining us. And we will see you or have you hear us next time on the Fuel Pulse Show podcast.